be occupied by scorpions and serpents. In the rainy season, of course, the ground would be turned into mud. And those who were lowered down into them would experience the sense of great dread and fear and great depression of spirit. And we saw as we thought about David's experience that he narrates it for us in Psalm 40 that he is picturing for us not only his own experience but the experiences of believers who oftentimes find themselves in places of darkness. Places that could only be likened to pits. They're in a place of darkness, in a place perhaps of depression. They're in a place of seemingly insurmountable and inescapable difficulty. Let it be through circumstances that relate to family or our physical health or perhaps our finances or perhaps as a result of the direct attack of demonic forces upon their mind and soul, and they feel themselves to be stuck in a miry pit, in a place of horror, and in a place of dread. And David indicates to us, as we thought of his testimony, that so intense and so inescapable was his situation and condition of soul that the Lord himself was his only hope of deliverance. And so he cried out to the Lord. And he waited for the Lord. And this waiting was a waiting of expectancy and hope. Anticipating that God will be faithful to his child and faithful to his promises to his child. And in his own appointed way and in his own appointed time would come and deliver him and rescue him. And David was not disappointed. And that's the whole point of Psalm 40. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit and out of the miry clay and he said a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And David's experience was, was, let me repeat, not unique to him. This experience of David represents that which believers often endure. And I would venture to say that there are believers in this very service this morning. And if I were to go down and ask you where you're at spiritually, how you're feeling emotionally or mentally, you would say, David, I feel as if I'm in a dark pit. And the intensity of the darkness is creating a depression of spirit and of soul and I can find no way out and the Lord and the Lord alone is my hope at this time I want to stay with this theme of the believer being in a pit and I wanted to, to stay with it uh, basing my remarks this morning on what we have read from Jeremiah 38 concerning the experience of Jeremiah the prophet who was very literally and actually placed into a pit he was placed there, as the context reveals, as a direct result of those who were opposing the truth that he spoke in the name of the Lord. He was put there with the intention that he might be shut up, and that he would no longer be able to bring the message to the people. And he was put there, moreover, in order that his spirit might be broken, and that because of the fearfulness of that experience of being deep, deep down, in such a dark and slimy pit filled with all kinds of fears real and imaginary that his spirit might be so broken that he would not speak again the truth that God had given to him to minister to the people in his name. But especially this morning I want you to think of how that he was delivered out of this circumstance. The focus of the chapter is upon a man whose name you probably have never heard before unless you're a regular reading of the old, a right reader of the Old Testament prophets. He was an Ethiopian. He was a eunuch. Did you know there was an Ethiopian eunuch in the Old Testament as well as the New? There's one in Acts chapter 8, the man who was converted by the preaching of the gospel by Philip the Evangelist as he read Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 53, and here's an Old Testament Ethiopian eunuch. 
His name is a significant one. His name, Ebed Melech. It's hard to get your tongue around that. But these are actually a compound of two Hebrew words. Ebed means servant. Melech means king. His name literally means servant of the king. And he is the man who takes it upon himself, having heard of the perilous plight that God's servant Jeremiah was in, takes it upon himself to go to Zedekiah the king and make intercession for Jeremiah. And stating that Jeremiah's situation was indeed a perilous one because he would die in the city. He would die of hunger. There was no longer any bread in the city because of the siege of the Chaldean or the Babylonian army. And of course, being a prisoner, as Jeremiah was, and being incarcerated in the worst part of the prison, the pit that was in the court of the prison yard, Jeremiah would have been the last person to receive whatever meager provisions that were still left in the city. And he immediately recognizes the danger that Jeremiah was in. And he says to the king, we, that Jeremiah will die. He will die in that pit because there is no bread in the city. And Zedekiah, again, surprisingly, this is a very vacillating man who goes back and forward all the time without backbone, without any seeming driving principle guiding him. He says, go ahead, take 30 men with you and rescue Jeremiah from the pit. And so he goes and he takes these old rags, lowers them down to Jeremiah, says, put them under or between your armpits and the ropes so the rope wouldn't cut into his body as they lifted him up. And they drew him out of the pit. You say, well, that's an interesting story, but what is, is its message for us today? I believe that what we have in Jeremiah's very literal deliverance and rescue from a very literal pit, an illustration or a picture, if you like, of how the Lord delivers his people when they find themselves in all kinds of dark and dreadful <coughs> pits. The focus, as I've said, is upon this man, Ethan Melek, the servant of the king. He was a man who obviously dwelt in the king's court. He was part of the king's household. And it was in and through him that Jeremiah's rescue would be effected. You say, who does, who does Ebed Melech represent? <laughs> if we're taking this as an illustration of a spiritual deliverance that the people of God <coughs> can experience and do experience when they are in the darkness, does this man, Ebed Melech, not picture or illustrate for us one who is an even greater servant of the king? And you will remember, brothers and sisters, that this is the title that is given to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you read through the prophecy of Isaiah, particularly the latter part of the prophecy of, of Isaiah, and, and for example, read verses such as Isaiah 42 and verse 1, you'll find the Lord saying words like this, Behold my servant whom I hold, my elect in whom my soul delights. He goes on telling us that he would not break a bruised reed or quench a smoking flax. And the question obviously comes in, who is the Lord speaking about through Isaiah when he's saying, Behold my servant, focus your attention upon this one who does not break the bruised reed, who does not quench the, 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 the smoking flax or the smoking wick. When you come across to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, and verses 18 through to 21, you'll discover that Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he writes his gospel, applies these words very clearly to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And over and over again, as you go on through the latter part of Isaiah, you will find this, this reference to my servant. God keeps talking about my servant. He, he's a perfect servant of Jehovah. He is the suffering servant of Jehovah. And all the portraiture that we have of him in the latter part of Isaiah points us very clearly to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God's perfect servant. And I believe that we have an Ebed Milik 
And anybody that be like did for Jeremiah, a wonderful illustration and a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ, God's servant, the servant of the King of heaven himself, does in rescuing us from the pits into which we often find ourselves being brought. And I want you to notice three things very simply about this man who is our Jeremiah's deliverer. Things that we can see very much. In fact, we can see in all of their perfection in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The first thing that grips my attention as I think about Ibn Melik is this, that he very much has the interests of God's servant and heart. I think that comes across very clearly. It is when he hears the news, Jeremiah the prophet has been placed into the pit, that it seems that immediately, instantaneously, that he hears these words that he heads off as it were, on his own initiative to come and seek out the king, King Zedekiah, who at that time was sitting in the, in the Benjamin gate of the city. And when kings did that, the idea was that they would sit in the gate and they would hear petitions and requests that were brought to them. To, to them. And among those who came that day to Zedekiah was this member of his own household, even me, like the Ethiopian eunuch. And when he speaks to the king, he spreads before the king the terrible dilemma in which God's faithful servant Jeremiah found himself. And he says these men have done evil and all that they did to Jeremiah by casting him into the pit. And he will die there with hunger for there is no bread in the city. Here's a man who very evidently has the interest. He is a concern for the Lord, for the Lord's servant at heart. Dear brother or sister this morning. I would want you to know this, that whatever kind of pit you find yourself in today or may find yourself in the future, there is one who has your interests at heart. There is one who has your interests laying heavily upon his heart. I'll come to this, I don't want to jump ahead in the sermon too much at the moment, but one of the great pictures that God gives to us of our Lord Jesus Christ in relation to his people is the picture of him as the great high priest. And that takes us back to the Old Testament covenant. And you remember that the high priest of Israel, appointed and anointed by God for his particular office, in the garments that he wore, had among those garments two very distinctive articles of, I'm going to call them jewelry, that's hardly the name, they were they, they were uh, pieces of um, equipment that were made out of jewels and metal that were attached to the garments of the high priest. Some of them were upon his shoulders and some of them were upon his breast in a breastplate. The breastplate had 12 stones in it and each stone represented the, the nations of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. On his shoulders, on either shoulder, there was a stone, and on each stone there was engraved upon it the names of the tribes of Israel. And when the high priest on the Day of Atonement, and you'll read of that in Leviticus chapter 17, went through the ritual of that day, through the outer veil and through the second veil, into what was called the Holy of Holies, or the holiest of all, and he stood there before the Ark of the Covenant with the burning fire of the Shekinah presence of God between the two cherubim, the high priest stood before God with the names of the people of Israel on his breast close to his heart and the names of the people of God upon his shoulders in the place of strength. And what a wonderful picture that is of our great high priest. You know, he stands in the presence of God, beloved, this morning, and just like the high priest of old, he has our names upon his heart. He has our names upon his heart. And there is nothing that you can face as a child of God. There is no eventuality that can come your way. There is no circumstance that you can possibly experience. But your great high priest, the servant of the king, God's greater Ebed Melech, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you can know this, 
that he is the one who is deeply interested in your welfare, whatever that particular condition is. You'll notice that he's cognizant of Jeremiah's position. He knows that Jeremiah is in the pit. He knows accurately and exactly where, he, where Jeremiah is at. And you may come into a situation where you feel yourself to be in such a pit that you cannot hardly describe it to others, maybe not even to yourself. The people would say to you, but with the best of intentions, well, how are you doing? What is your experience? What is the state and condition of your soul? And you say, I hardly know how to put it into words. Let me tell you, there is one who understands it perfectly. There's one who knows it completely and accurately and exactly the end from the beginning. He knows it even better than you and I know it ourselves. And isn't it wonderful to know that we have a friend and a brother who has taken our interests upon his own heart and he knows exactly where we're at and what we're going through. I think of the words that the Lord spoke when he called Moses to go to Egypt again and to lead the people of God out of Egyptian bondage. And there's little words that occur at the end of God's commission to Moses as he tells him to go down and speak to Israel. And he says this, for I know their sorrows. I know their sorrows. Dear brother and sister, this morning, your Lord knows your sorrows. He knows exactly what it's causing. He knows exactly the depth of anguish that you feel in account of them. He knows exactly how long you have experienced them. But he even knows more than that. You think of the experience of Job when he was going through trial after trial after trial after trial. You know, Job didn't know what was going on in the heavenly places. He didn't know about God's challenge that had been given to Satan. Go, that's my servant Job. And this is what you can do to him and that's as far as you can go and you can't go any further. Job didn't know any about anything of that. But you see, when we're going through circumstances, we're like Job. We don't know all that's going on, but we have one who does. And praise his name, he not only knows, but he is an absolute and perfect control. Not only did, does the Lord Jesus know exactly our position, but let me tell you something else this morning. He knows it by experience. That's why we can read in the book of Hebrews where the writer said, We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. <coughs> but we have a high priest who is in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Our Lord Jesus Christ knew what it was to experience so much of that which causes us heartache and sorrow, brings us into this dark pit. And I'll just give you one example of that. You may be of, uh, in a depressed state of mind and soul. You may be, I read this just last week, did you know that the, one of the greatest preachers of the English-speaking world has ever had, Charles Hatton Spurgeon, battled with intense depression? On one occasion, speaking to his congregation, he quoted the words from the book of Job, that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than life. And Spurgeon said, so intense was my misery that I would have laid hands upon myself to end it. That's a servant of God speaking. And it may be that there are some of you this morning and you know something of that experience. That's the dark pit that you're in. I want to tell you this morning, your Lord Jesus, he knew something of that. You remember when he came into the Garden of Gethsemane and when he prayed before his father. And you know what he said to his disciples? He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. He knows, he understands. How great it is when you're in darkness to know that somebody knows. But more than that, they know by experience. They've been there. They've been through it. I never think of of that issue, but I think of uh, friends of mine and, and my first pastor in the north of Ireland. Uh, he was a church elder and his wife, and they lost their little boy at 10 years of age to a brain tumor. And I have to say concerning Harry and Hazel that their testimony throughout that dark 
experience was absolutely glorious. And you know, Hazel, the mother, has a great ministry today. She makes it her, her calling, her ministry, to go to parents whose children are critically ill or dying. And she can actually sit down beside them and she can say, I understand. I've been there. The Lord Jesus understands. He's been there. He knows where you're at. And he has your interests at heart. And he's not only cognizant, he's not only conscious and aware and perfectly aware and knows by experience of what we're going through, but he cares. He's not indifferent. He's not indifferent. And over and over again in Scripture, when his people are going through the fire and going through the flood and going through the darkness and being and finding themselves in the furnace of affliction, if I can use this kind of terminology concerning God, that it is there that he takes pains to remind his people, and that with clarity, and that again and again, how much he loves them, and how much he cares for what they're going through. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. Dear brother or sister this morning, whether you're in that pit today or whether you're going to find yourself in it in the future because we know not what a day may lay ahead of us, please do remember this, that there is one who has your interest at heart and he knows exactly all about it at the end from the beginning. And we are told by the Apostle Peter that we can cast all our care upon him because, listen, he cares for us. When I'm beaten in the fight, Jesus knows. When my day has turned to night, Jesus knows. When sunshine turns to rain, when joy turns into pain, and life seems all in vain, Jesus knows. Praise his name. But not only do we find in Ebed Melek, one who has the interest of God's servant at heart, he cares, he's compassionate. He's moved by the circumstances of the Lord's servant. But secondly, you'll notice this, and this is very obvious from the reading, he actually intercedes for God's servant. He goes before the king. He hurries from the king's house to where the king is at, at the Benjamin Gate. And he begins to speak to the king on Jeremiah's behalf, as it were, he becomes Jeremiah's advocate. He's speaking on his behalf as his representative. And here's a blessed thought, beloved, this morning, that the one who is a greater servant of the king, who has our interest upon his heart, even our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the one who not only has our interests upon his heart, but he is the one who intercedes on our behalf before the throne of God. I love the words of that hymn, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and what pleads for me. I remember the principal of our Bible college saying on one occasion, just a simple statement in passing in one of his sermons, but it stuck with me and it has stayed with me ever since. He said, you know, it is no vain thing to have your name mentioned in heaven. It is no vain thing to have your name mentioned in heaven. And did you know, brother, sister, this morning that your name was mentioned in heaven? Oh yes, it's mentioned by your loved ones and your friends as you pour out your heart and you ask them to pray for you and they do. And the prayers of the saints are likened in the book of the Revelation to having been put into golden bowls. And the, the, the vapors, the odors ascend from those bowls before the throne of God. That's a wonderful picture, by the way, and very instructive. What was the bowl? It was a place of storage. Do you know what that tells me? It tells me that the prayers of the saints are stored up before God. They're stored up before His throne. 
And you may have prayed a prayer many years ago. You may have even have forgotten even that you prayed it. But God hasn't forgotten it. It's stored up before Him. And what is more, those bowls into which the prayers of the saints are put. And of course, this is a language that is figurative. It is imagery. These are golden bowls. What does that tell me? Not only that the prayers of the saints are stored before God, but they're precious to God. And there they are, and they ascend before the throne of God continually. But you know, even if you cannot pray for yourself, and even if your nearest and dearest forget to pray for you when you're in the pit, you can know this. You have a friend at court. You have one who even now is in the presence of God. And you know what he's doing? He's mentioning your name. He's praying for you. All the wonder of that. Could we conceive of that picture in our minds where our great high priest, now who, in the words of Hebrews, has passed into the heavens, just as the ancient priest of Israel passed into the holiest of all, into the presence of God himself, having made the sacrifice upon the altar, he takes the blood into the inner sanctuary and sprinkles it on the mercy seat and stands before the presence of God and pleads for the people of Israel. Our great high priest has made the sacrifice. He has sacrificed himself. And not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. He has entered into the very presence of God himself. And just like the ancient priest of Israel, he is making intercession for us. He appears <coughs> in the presence of God before us. How my dearest, please. How faithful is his intercession. How effective are his prayers? You know, maybe the pit into which you have fallen is the pit of sin. You have soiled, as it were, your garments, to use the language of Scripture. The garments are stained by sin. Even as the garments of a person thrown into the muddy pit, such as what Jeremiah had been thrown into, what would happen? Well, after a while of leaning against the wall, they would get tired and they would sink down into the mire and they would become filthy. And their garments would become polluted by the mire. And they need not only to be rescued, but they needed to be washed and their garments needed to be changed. What a picture of the gospel. Isn't this what the Lord Jesus Christ does when he comes to rescue sinners? He takes them out of the pit, but he does more. He washes them. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And when John saw in the book of the Revelation the saints in glory, and he asked who they were, and the answer was given, These are they that have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He lifts us, he cleanses us, he clothes us. He takes off the polluted and filthy garments, and he dons us with the perfect, white, spotless robe of his own perfect righteousness. This is our intercessor. And when you're in this place of the pit this morning, let it be a pit of sin, a pit of depression, a pit of difficulty, a pit of darkness of mind and of soul, a pit that has been caused by demonic activity. Whatever it happens to be, know this. Lift your eyes and look to heaven itself and know you have a representative in heaven. And if you fall into sin, John says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The last thought is this. And I look at Ibn Milik and I see in him his interest. The interest in his heart in God's servant and I see it in perfection in the Lord Jesus. I see his intercession as he stands before the king for God's servant and I see that in an even greater way in the Lord Jesus. But when we looked at his interest and his intercession, let us look finally at his intervention. See, the end of the thing about this man, he would be like, was this. He wasn't only prayerful, he was practical. The king gives to Ebed Melek this commission. He says, take with you 30 men from here and lift Jeremiah out, the prophet out of the pit, lest he die or before he dies. And so Ebed Melek, having been given this 
royal commission from Zedekiah. He goes to the king's house. He goes to a wardrobe in the storehouse. He takes out some old rags and worn out clothes. And he goes with the 30 men to the top of the pit. You can picture the scene. They remove the stone. Maybe that's why there were 30 people, men that needed to do it. It would be a large stone that would have covered the, the mouth of the pit and kept God's servant who was there in total darkness. Darkness that could be felt. And they move the stone and then they take a rope and they lower down these old rags down to Jeremiah. And they say, put the rags, put the old clothes between your armpits and the rope. And he does that and they pull him up and he is set again on solid ground. He not only asks, even Melech does, but he acts. And our Lord Jesus Christ is not only the one who makes intercession for us, he is actually the one who intervenes to bring about our deliverance. The task of delivering his people is one which has been given to him by his Father. And the task which he discharges faithfully and continually and joyfully. You think of this and we thought, I think, last Sunday as we considered David's experience in Psalm 40, David was in such a condition that he recognized that only the Lord could help him. Only the Lord had the grace enough and only the Lord had power enough. You may be in some kind of a pit this morning and you recognize, listen, it's beyond any human wisdom. It's beyond any human ingenuity. It's beyond any human power. If I'm ever going to get out of this, it's going to have to be the Lord. Well, let me tell you about this Lord that comes to the rescue of his people. He is just that. He is the Lord. And all power in heaven and earth belong unto him. And there is nothing impossible with him. And you remember how Job said concerning him, Lord, I know that you can do everything. Here's a wonderful thing to know in the, in the darkness of your pit, that my things seem impossible to you, they are not impossible to him. He takes on the task. We know his task and how he discharges it faithfully and joyfully and successfully. But there's a little point here. You may have wondered why that the inspired writers were led of the Holy Spirit to, 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 to make this point, this seeming trivial incidental about him going into the wardrobe and bringing out old rags and lowering the rags down to Jeremiah. Here was a man who was very cognizant of the fact that if they simply put him down by a rope, or pulled him out by a rope as he had probably been put down. What happens when that <coughs> when the rope tightens around you here, around your waist? It cuts into your body and it hurts. Here was a man who was considerate of Jeremiah. Here was a man who wanted to rescue him, but he wanted to rescue him with tenderness. With tenderness. And so the first thing he does is they put these old rags under your arms. The ropes then go around them and so the rope doesn't hurt him. The hymn writer penned the words in loving kindness, Jesus came. My soul in mercy to reclaim and from the depths of sin and shame through grace he lifted me. From sinking sands he lifted me, listen, with tender hands. He lifted me from shades of night to plains of night. All oh, praise his name. He lifted me. Have you know the Lord doing that for you? Could you say amen if you have? Amen. You know the tenderness of the Lord? The loving kindness of the Lord? The one who is so acutely aware of your need that when he deals with you, he deals not with harshness or carelessness but with consideration and tender compassion. And I just wind up this by saying this to you this morning. And why we see in Ebed Melech, the servant of the king, a picture of our Lord Jesus, we're also seeing here an example that instructs us of what we are to be and what we are to do. Because 
The point is this, brothers and sisters, that the Lord often, when he comes to rescue his people out of the dark pit, he uses instruments to do that. He uses means to do that. And do you know who his instruments are? His people. His people. And even if we look not only pictures the Lord Jesus Christ and his great rescuing work of bringing his people out of fearful pits and out of Mary clay, but he is a picture for us of how we are to follow that example. I wonder, brother or sister, this morning, if you know a brother or sister who's down in the pit, do you take their interests to your heart? Even as even Melech had the interests of the Lord's servant upon his heart. It may very well be, if you think about this in the case of Eva even Melech, the Lord had a man at the right place and at the right time when Jeremiah was put into the pit. It was no accident that Ebed Melech was in the court of the king. It was no accident that Ebed Melech knew exactly or heard exactly what had happened to Jeremiah. He was the Lord's man at the right time and very often in our rescue and in the experience of our deliverances, the Lord will have so ordained that the right person will be right there at the right time to say and to do exactly the right thing. The Apostle Paul, in one of his letters, and he had gone through an awful lot of trial, and he makes this, again, seemingly passing reference, he says, but God who comforts those who are cast down comforted us with the coming of Titus. <laughs> the Lord brought Titus to Paul exactly at the right time. When he most needed the comfort, the Lord brought Titus again into Paul's life to encourage him in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, do we see this as a ministry that the Lord has given to us all as his people? Think of all of those one another texts that we often hear about that are spoken of in the New Testament. To love one another, to be patient with one another, to pray for one another, to bear for one another's burdens. You know, Christian religion... A great Scottish theologian said, is on one level a very personal religion in that we all have to have our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he went on to say this, it is at the very same time a social religion in that when God saves us, when God regenerates us, he puts us into a family. And what's the family for? Well, our family's for. To be there for one another, among other things. To take the interests of, of the brothers and sisters to heart. And especially is this the case when that brother or sister finds themselves in a dark place. And let me just give you one example. What if the dark place is a place of backsliding? What if the dark place is a pit of sin into which they have fallen? What is the child of God who hears about that to do? Number one, don't repeat it. Number two, don't kick them when they're dying. Number three, remember, there but for the grace of God go I. And then take to heart the words of Paul in Galatians 6. He says, if a brother is overtaken in a fault, in a brother who's fallen, he's fallen into sin. He says, you who are spiritual, restore that one. And restore them in the spirit of meekness. What is meekness in scripture? It is gentleness. Here's the tenderness coming through again. Restore them gently. Restore them tenderly. Considering yourself. Lest you also be tempted. And when you reach out to, to give a hand to a brother or sister who has fallen into sin. Do that with the recognition that you must reflect the very character of the Savior himself. When he rescued you. And reach out your hand with compassion and with gentleness and with joy and pull them up and set their feet again upon the rock. Make intercession for them. Oh, it's, uh, let me repeat it again. It's, it's no vain thing to bring a name to the throne of grace. 
Sometimes when a brother or sister pours out their heart and you don't know, you hardly know what to say to them. You can hardly understand the situation that they're in. But say this and mean it when you say it. I will pray for you. Don't just say it to get rid of it. Because it's an irritation or an annoyance. And having taken that interest upon your heart, then take it to the throne of grace. Pray for them. There's a brother, there's a sister, Lord. They're coming through a terrible time, a dark time. I don't understand it all. I don't understand what they can do or where to go. I don't know even what to say to them. But Lord, you know all things and I know you love them. And they're their child, they're your child. You love them more than their nearest and nearest could even love them. And Lord, you have their interest in heart. Lord, would you, would you look upon them in grace? Would you look upon them with tender mercy? Would you give them, Lord, the very strength that they need? You can either, Lord, remove the circumstance or you can give them strength to come through the circumstance. But, but whatever it is, Lord, you know what you can. Pray for them. And if it is practical, not only take the interest and make intercession, but make an intervention. It may be that there, God has put you there and there, there is some way that you can help. Maybe they find themselves in a very practical difficulty. Maybe, for example, it is a financial difficulty. And the Lord brings you into their life and they make you aware of their situation. Consider the finances that the Lord has given to you to be exactly that, the finances that the Lord has given you. Not that you might own them, but that you might be a steward of them for him. And ask the Lord, is there a way in which I can help this brother or this sister in this particular circumstance? And we can be practical about it. We can intervene. We can be there. All else fails. You know, sometimes you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. But sometimes your very presence with them is in itself a matter of, God, a matter of great strength to them. Perhaps you can provide the food. Perhaps you can look after the children. Perhaps you can help in some way towards the pain. Whatever it is. That's the ministry that the Lord has given to us all. What a wonderful thing to know that in the pits of life that we've often found ourselves in. We're neither never alone nor without hope. There's one who cares. And there's one who knows exactly what to say and knows exactly what to do. And his name is Jesus. <coughs> Let's sing as we conclude our service this morning. 369.